Welcome, welcome to Basketball Heads Live. I'm your host, Glenn Poole Hardy. And tonight, we have a very special guest and a friend of the show. This basketball head started her career dominating the Catholic school scene before being named 1989 Gatorade's Player of the Year, making her the first female to do so in New York City. After being heavily recruited, she decided to attend Arizona State University. While at Arizona State, this basketball head suffered a few injuries that would set her back. Being the determined woman she is, she began to rehab and train smarter to get back to playing the game that she loves. When things didn't go as planned, she reverted back to plan A, education, and got her doctorate degree. While receiving her doctorate, this basketball head got her mind and her body right as she started to play professional football in the professional women's football league. How ill is that? And she also boxed in the Golden Gloves. Now she runs her own physical therapist business called Mind Over Body Athletics. Help me welcome to the show, New York City legend and 1989 Gatorade Player of the Year, Dr. Laura Milley. And she's also an author. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Yes. 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 You have you just stepped into, into, into the world, world, world of chaos. chaos. Where everybody, Where everybody goes, goes hard. hard. Tickets because the game about to start. What's up, Laura? What's going on? What's happening? <laughs> oh man, this is this is awesome. I'm glad to get you back on the show. Do this the right way, you know. And, and, I, and I, I'm glad I got to change up the intro a little bit because I got to say, Doctor Laura. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to be back. That's for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely, definitely. So you, you know, you've been. Part of the show before, you know how this goes. Who introduced you to the game, Laura? Well, watching the Knicks. Watching the, the New York Knicks back in the day. Watching St. John's University. Nobody uh, specifically in, um, introduced me to it. I guess my dad used to coach CYO, and he coached my brother. And uh, I think just watching players all around me, watching my dad coach, I decided to, you know, pick up a ball and start dribbling around a little bit. And that was it. And just pretty much just watching the game my whole life. It's all around you in New York, especially growing up in Queens. Yeah. And, you know, watching your brothers, you know, usually girls stay on the side. You actually wanted to get involved, right? <laughs> That's right. You played, you, played with, you, you played with a lot of New York City greats. Let's just say that. I did. I did. You know, um, it's funny because I feel like I'm repeating myself since we had this this interview again. So I'm trying to make sure that I, I, I remember a lot of the stuff we discussed and I want to make sure that I do bring everything to the forefront and I feel like, you know, sometimes I'm like, did I just repeat myself? No, but, it's all good. But yeah, I did. I mean, I had the opportunity to play with a lot of uh, different street ball legends, you know, um, uh, Conrad McCray. You know, yeah, um, McNasty, you know, Conrad and I, he was, he was my boy. Um, Robert Phelps, I played yes. with Lloyd Daniels back in the day. Uh, Lloyd was the bomb. I mean, I played in those pro-am tournaments, and Lloyd was lighting it up from half court. He was little, Whoa. and he was lighting it up. <laughs> right, right, so, right. You know, uh he, no matter, no matter what he was doing and into, he was still hooping. So it was just uh, Jamal Faulkner, you know, Definitely. I got to play with. So there's a lot of guys just all over Brooklyn, Queens, the city, you know, that I got to play with. Right. Um, I used to play a lot in uh, 118th and Lennox Ave. 
136 in Malcolm X Boulevard. I don't remember the name of the park. Okay. Of course, okay. I, of course, I played at Rucker before too. I played at the <laughs> cage in the village because I had right. to make sure I had to make sure I could. <laughs> you know, so listen, the the cage can be a little uh how can I say intimidating because it's so small and you don't realize how exciting the game can become once you're playing. So it's a difference when you're watching because you think, you know, it's be, it'll be too small for you to maneuver. But once the game starts moving, trust me, I've been out there with seven footers and guys that were huge and we still got to play. That's right. But have you ever played in the basement of Riverside Church? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think what you played in the basement. You shoot too high, it's going to the ceiling. Definitely. <laughs> You know, I think if you play in the basement of Riverside Church, that cage don't seem too small. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but wow. no, I agree. I mean, there's a lot of energy at that park. So if you could go there and play and the guys pick you up, it's a pretty big deal. So I'm, yes. I'm privileged. I had the opportunity to, to do a lot of that different stuff in the city when I was out there. What part of the city are you from? I'm from Queens, Elmhurst, Queens. Nice, nice, nice. And from there... You took off and went to Christ the King. That's like, right. Look, I had uh, Deborah Mortley on uh, a while back, and she was just talking about how you guys used to just pummel them, like, year after year after year until they got their weight up. And in all due respect, she was like, those girls can compete. But when we got in a level, it just felt good to finally reach that level because you guys just kept going after that, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, how was your think, time there? Well, I believe that with a, a few other gals with me, I was a pioneer, you know, because the, the, the Christ the King that you know, we all, all see, we were with the Sue Bird and, um, oh God, uh, uh, Charles, I can't remember her last name, and then Shemiko Holzpawn, you know, the big yes. players that came after uh, me subsequently, you know, um, they changed the game a little bit. They did elevate it. I mean, we did also because we didn't lose a league game in like, God, 30 years, we didn't lose a game. Um, when I played, we were, we just got to be number one in the country. So it was a big deal. We took the state championship when I played. Um, you know, there was Margaret McEwen before me and Joe Cook, and they were two, the two All-Americans who were there before me. And I remember just wanting to emulate them and be like them because I didn't even know you can get a basketball scholarship when I played. Most wow. of the girls, yeah, most of the girls at Christ the King were on scholarship and, um, you know, they were invited to play and I wasn't, you know, I just, I was going to go out, my brother and sister went to St. Francis Prep and I'll, I, you know, I didn't really want to go there. I didn't right. even know if I could make the team at Christ the King. I was intimidated thinking, I don't know if I could, you know, make the team. So I went and I tried out and I made it. And then I saw these girls who were these all-American basketball players. I didn't know anything about a scholarship. I just wanted the ball. It didn't right. matter, you know? <laughs> and when I first played, the funny thing about it is, you know, as a freshman, I was still growing, and I was getting beat out a little bit, and I didn't like that so much, you know? So I'd go home, and I'd shovel the snow and the ice in the yard, and I'd go out there and practice, and then sometimes my dad would come out. He's like, you're not taking your layups right. And you're not, you know, you need to be tough. He'd, like, throw me into the garage. <laughs> and like you need to get tough, you know. And I was like, all right. So, um, yeah, Christ the King was crazy back then. Uh, Vinny Canizaro was our coach. Okay. And, I mean, the 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 bench would be fifteen large. There was not a girl on the bench that could not come in and just score. Mm. So you really had to work for your spot. It wasn't you know one of those teams where there was a set five, and then there were some girls on the bench, and then only the five stayed in. Anything, you know, if you did something wrong, you're coming out and someone's going to come in and, and, you know, play. Maybe not exactly at your level, but can still hold their own. Wow. Do, do you remember who you guys beat in the city championship, that, that state championship year? Oh, yeah, St. Peter's. <laughs> I, um, that year, I hit a buzzer shot in the state championship in the semifinal. I was, a, I was actually a junior, and I was ranked number seven in the state. 
And, um, yeah, there was, uh, it was one of those games where, man, I couldn't hit the ocean. I could not. I had a ton of assists, but it didn't matter. I threw the ball up, and it didn't make a difference. I was not hitting that hoop. I, I don't know how many points I had in that game, maybe six or eight. I don't know. And uh, there was a freshman. She was um, Darlene Starr. I'll never forget. She was coming down, and it was like seconds left on the clock. And it's overtime. Uh, well, actually, we, yeah, it was overtime. And uh, it was 42, maybe 40 or 42, I don't know. It was somewhere in the 40. And she came down and she looked to shoot. And I'm like, I, like, I want the ball. You know, I, I was always a pressure cooker. And I was like, I want the ball. So I'm like, ball, oh, give me the ball. And I, the only game that I have of me playing in high school or college, the only in video. Swim. Wow. Yeah, only. Yep. So. I'm like, give me the ball. Like, Whoa, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like a ten footer from, you know, right on the, the the end of the what do you call it? Um, where I can't even think right now. I'm so tired. But um, I'm sorry. I've been editing my book all day. No joke. All day I got the first edit back, and my brain is mush right now. So I apologize. Oh, anyway, it's so, so good. So it's all good. as soon as I released it, the buzzer went off. But I knew, and I just said, please go in, <laughs> you know, just like, and uh, it went in, and we went nuts, and we won, it was so awesome. But listen, that goes to show what kind of mindset that you have, and what kind of drive you have, because even when shots wasn't going for you, you still wanted the ball. You still oh, yeah. wanted to be that person to decide whether y'all going to win or lose. And that's a lot of pressure to put in yourself. You know, I don't know if you think about it as pressure at the time of the game. I mean, my, my end line, like I have a signature line that I still use now for my emails are um, on the line shooting two, down by one, no time left on the clock. You know, that's just the way I've always operated. I've always been a pressure cooker, you know. And the funny thing is before the games, I'm nervous just like anybody else. Uh, when it comes down, when it comes down to it, I want the ball. Right. You know, and um it's funny because because in the book that I'm writing, one of the guys, Terrence Wheeler, he played ball with me at ASU, and uh, yes. he played overseas in Venezuela and in all different places. And he he was like, he called me L. He's like, Yo, L, no matter what, at the end of the game, we knew if we needed to get the ball up to get it to somebody, we knew to get it to you because you oh you you were pressure cooking. You always wanted that ball. And you were tenacious. And it's funny because now when I play in my men's leagues. I can care. Like, I want to make the shot, but I'd rather be the person to make the shot. I don't know why. I think I, I've tried to subdue that, um, just that competitiveness, just because I hadn't played ball for so long that I had to simmer it down. If not, I was going to go cuckoo. Listen, hold on. Because did y'all hear what she said? She said she was playing in the men's league. She wasn't just playing with it. You know some other women. She was she's playing in a men's league. <laughs> All right. So let, let's back it up. Let's back it up a little bit so we can get uh, <laughs> the story lined up with what you're doing right now. Because once you left, you. Uh, there we go. Once you left high school, you chose to go to Arizona State. Correct. Right now, do you remember the schools that were recruiting you besides Arizona State? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I really wanted to play for UCLA. But back in the day, all the California schools were getting, the girls were getting recruited by their, you know, by their own. California is such a big state. Yeah. But um, I would say most of the Big East, I can't think of too many schools not from the Big East, maybe Georgetown. Right. Uh, I remember Duke, um, Wake Forest. Mm. Uh, God, Auburn, uh, not Auburn, um, Clemson, uh, Texas A&M, UTEP, I mean, New Mexico, I mean, just, just all over the, it was all over the place, Wisconsin, right. it, was, it was all over the country, and um, wow. I know that when I went to Arizona with uh, Riverside Church my junior year, and I saw that campus and all those palm trees at Arizona State, I just, um, I just fell in love with it. Now I came home and I told my parents I had, I had Arizona State boxers on. I had tank top, you know. I I think you know back in the day we didn't have any money, 
And I swear to you, I must have spent whatever money my parents gave me to eat <laughs> for the week on those clothes because I, you know, I wanted the tank top and the boxing shorts so bad, you know. I mean, did it take care you down there? Did it? Did it give you no gear? Nothing? Nothing? Did you anything? No, this is before I was getting. This is when I first saw Arizona State. They, oh, okay, 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 okay. When you went down, down with Riverside, got you, got you, got you. Down with Riverside, got you. Okay, we're having, got you. you. Know, actually, a few of the girls got arrested for you know I don't get into that, but <laughs> but um, out in the Scottsdale, that was funny. But you know, I didn't even know I wanted to go to Arizona State when they heard my coach told them that I was interested, and that was it. You know what I mean? Because the head coach had left. She was originally at Oklahoma, and they were recruiting me big time in Oklahoma. And my father's like, what are you going to do, a Queens girl, in Oklahoma? <laughs> so I'm like, all right, you're right. But then when I saw Arizona State, I was hooked. I was like, West Coast, the sun's going to shine all year. Look at these palm trees, you know. So that was that. Wow. That's in the building. Okay. It was in between, my, my picks were in between Providence versus um, Arizona State. And um, my reasons for staying in the Big East probably wouldn't have been advantageous for me for as it was to go West, you know what I mean? Um, so I made a choice. I can't try to stay because of somebody I was you know, talking to at the time who was going to Syracuse <laughs> uh, ver versus, you know, me going to Arizona State. So that's, right. that's how that went. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, Pat Alfonso, what's up? He said that was the BCI championship. Was that Arizona State? Ah, uh, who, who said that? Pat Alfonso. Ah, uh, yeah, it was BCIs. Yeah, we were always going yeah. down. I think two summers we went to the BCIs down in Arizona. I think everybody had gone, right? Did you guys, I don't know if the guys all went, I know they went to BCI, but I don't know if they went to Arizona. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, Pat knows where all the tournaments hey, was at. You can remember. <laughs> <laughs> so you you got to accomplish all that you wanted at Christ the King, correct? Correct. And now you're going to go to Arizona State. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Ugh. That time there, we can make it as long as you want, as how brief as yeah, you. Well, it's brief you already know how. I'm, it's brief I feel a lot by Arizona way. State now. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna keep it one I I feel the way now, but go ahead. It was brief. <laughs> um, I went out there, and um, they they had you know we were considered the the Fab Five. The it was a really big recruiting class that came in, some really awesome players, and um, I I was uh, six men off the bench, and uh, no sooner than that I got injured, uh, right before Pac Tens in uh, about 1990, right probably I would say right after Christmas. Um, we had played a, a couple of games. We played against Washington, Washington State, and then I hurt my back. And um, that was that for that season. Came back my sophomore year, was playing again, made it right before Pac-10s, hurt my back again. I mean, I don't think it ever really healed, obviously. And then um, they had, they, the doctors back then, they were like, well, you know what? You, uh, you, don't you want to carry a baby? This is what they said to me. Don't you want to carry a baby? You, you, you're not going to be able to. If you ever want to get pregnant, how are you going to play? You can't even feel. Because I lost feeling in my left leg, and I had what they wow. were up for it. So, so after I ball, my leg would drag. And it was scary. I was scared. I was, you know, 20 years old, 19 years old. I, I was like, oh, my God, what do I do? So I went to doctors in New York. I came home. I had all these tests done. I've had needles. I can't even tell you the size of, like, a ruler in my back. I can't tell you how many. You know, wow. I saw that laugh, <laughs> and uh, yes. it was it was bad, and nothing would <laughs> and nothing would make it better. <laughs> so the doctor wouldn't the doctor wouldn't clear me. So my coach pushed to keep me going, and she was like, "Look, I don't care if you can practice. I want you to play in the Pac tens. So I don't care if you practice once a week. I want you to play. So." When I, I just heard this recently because I hadn't talked to her for 30 years. And when I went to Arizona, I want to sit down and have like a heart to heart with her. Yes. Because, you know, losing, losing 
after everything I had done in New York and all the aspirations I had, I wanted to be the 1992 Olympics, you know, that I had all these aspirations. She had aspirations for me. And then I was injured, so I was devastated. And I came and had a heart to heart with her. And she was like, I kept pushing for you to play, but you know, your father called me up and I guess my dad must have threatened her or something and said, I don't know what happened on that phone call. <laughs> but I think, you know, the doctor's telling my dad, this is your daughter. She's not gonna be able to have babies and stuff like that. You know, wow. which now you, that would never happen now. I mean, that's just so, I mean, it, that was in the early 90s. You wouldn't tell, you wouldn't tell your patients that? No, never. Well, I wouldn't do that. You know, I mean, if they came to me and said something like, make sure you just get your opinions. But I'm not a medical doctor. I have a PhD. So, but right. if someone came to me and told me that someone said that to them, I was like, well, you better check it out. But I did, you know, to my defense, I got a ton of different opinions. And I was waiting for that, that one doctor to say, you got it. But even though I kept pushing through it, um, the doctors wouldn't clear me. They, they put me on a medical. They gave me a medical scholarship. So I got to stay on scholarship, which was nice. But I didn't get the ball, and it was rough, you know, because I love ball. So that's why yeah, I'm so, I mean, I did so many things after that. You know, these doctors were wrong. Like, where, where did where did your toughness come from? <laughs> I don't know. My dad, my dad's a pretty tough guy. You know, I grew up, I'm Italian Puerto Rican, so my dad is, you know, tough Italian cop, and my mom is was born in Puerto Rico, and she's just this, traditional, you know, Hispanic mom. And so uh, I think she never got me when it came to my sports, but my dad did, you know, and um, my dad just tough. And I think I got it from him. My mom's yeah, tough. Yeah, when you came home, he jacked, he jacked you up. He jacked you up and, and threw you into that garage. Oh, yeah, yeah. And my mom would like yell at him. But my mom's tough too in her own way. Like my mom's gotcha. the kind of woman you don't want to mess with either. But my dad was more like, you know, growing up, it was like, you come home and say, Dad, when I was a little girl, this girl said this or did that. And he'd say, well, did you punch her in the face? And I'm like, no. He's like, then don't come home and complain about it unless you did something about it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's the way I was raised. So, <laughs> you know, he was looking at that stuff. So I was like, you know, that was frowned upon now. Back then it wasn't, you know, you take right, it in the right. face. What that's you say? Right. Boom. And then, you know, and then you're going to get pizza like two minutes later. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> I forget about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Listen, being a game rate player of the year, I know you had a talker in, on you, right? People yeah. like, there she go, there she go, Miss New York, there she go, and you get in the court and people want to challenge you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. More the guys, because there wasn't that many girls back then. Yeah, but listen, what, what, whatever the case, I knew there were some girls and some tough competition back then for some people that wanted to challenge you. Yeah, I mean, I played against, like, R um, Rhonda S uh, Singleton. I don't know where she is now. Marcy Cornegie. We actually, me and Marcy played on Riverside together. Rhonda didn't, I don't know if Rhonda, Rhonda ever tried out. But those girls, there was another girl, uh, Leticia, Leticia. I can't remember her last name. But we'd go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. We actually would play against each other in, like, the one-on-one -on -one tournaments. You know, stuff like that. But, yeah, people would. Uh, a lot of the girls would. But, you know, what's funny is they they talk stuff. And then once we played together, they saw that, you know, I could play ball. So then everybody kind of just chilled. It would be, oh, yeah, let's see what she's got until they played with me. And then it was different, you know. A lot, I mean, a lot of people, I, I mean, I heard the criticism when in, in 89 when I, I became the Gatorade Play of the Year. I was the number one player in the state. And, um, and for the city and the state. And, you know, girls like, oh, you know, she didn't deserve it, she whatever. But all those girls who said they didn't deserve it, I didn't see them getting Division One scholarships either. Mm. Talk that talk, Laura. Talk <laughs> that talk. You know That's what I'm right. saying. So, hey, it is what it is. Now, who was that, you know, do you remember that person who asked you had to put a spanking to let them know, listen, I'm the number one in the state and you see these up. I'm not going to say any names. Uh, is, is, it, is it in the book? Uh, if it's in a book, just tell them it's in a book, right? Tell them. It's in a book. Uh, it's not in the book. Actually, my, my publisher wanted me to pull some of the stories out of the book, unfortunately. <clears throat> Even some of the people that I interviewed and things that I interviewed have been kind of getting edited out on, you know. Wow. Because, I mean, the book, I guess the direction they, they want the book, like the book's mine, but you still have a publisher and you still have editors. 
<clears throat> and they have a better eye for what what people want to read or what people when you're gonna lose somebody. Who am I? People are gonna read my book. What you might read it, and a few people who know me, but if people are gonna reach out to read the book out of curiosity, who cares really about my story? You know. So, I mean, I give my story in the book about being a player, specifically about being an injured athlete. I talk about some bad stuff that happened to me when I was in high school. You know, that have to do with one of the athletic directors who was a priest. You know, and things I never spoke about before. Um, you know, it was bad and um, shouldn't have happened. And of course, it wasn't anything sexual. But I think what I allude to in my book is I was so scared to say anything because of the stuff that happened to me the, between this athletic director and myself that um, what if I was sexually abused back then? You know, I was tough, but was I, did he scare me to the point? You know, because he, he threatened my scholarship. He was like, if you, you know, oh. yeah, he's like, if you do this and that, I'm going to take away your scholarship. I'm going to make sure nobody gets, you don't get your letters. I'm going to make sure this, that, and the other. So God, you know, when I look back, I'm like, this guy, I, hopefully if he, if he tried to sexually abuse me, I'd know to knock him out. But what if I didn't? Because, I mean, the uh, the emotional and the mental abuse that he, he did to me, I mean, real quick, this, this guy would pull me out of class every day for about six months and tell me I was nothing. I didn't deserve this. Well, this is when I was a junior. I didn't deserve to score over the seniors because he had a favorite who was a senior and I was starting to overshadow her and he didn't like it. So, you know, I was like, so of course I didn't tell my father because, you know, my father would have choked the guy, priest or not, yes. you know. <laughs> right. So, so anyway, so the book goes into that, but then it goes into like different stories of different athletes. I interviewed a few different athletes. Um, I wish I could have gotten more, but a lot of athletes don't want to talk about it. like I'm, I'm calling out Kenny Anderson, yo Kenny, Miss Chibs. I'm a little upset that you didn't come through for my interview for my book. I'm just saying, but mm. um, some people don't want to speak about it. That's why my book's called you know the psyche, uh, you know the injured athlete, the unspoken truth. Some people don't want to speak about. The, the, how much it hurt when you were injured and you changed your, your life because you know we all play ball and we, we have all these talents and skills we want to keep playing I kept playing you know I went I went to Germany for a minute you know and then um, when I came home you know my mother's like you're gonna do something with yourself or you're gonna, you know <laughs> you know so I was a probation officer in my first life for a while but um, I, I never stopped the love for balls. So I just started coaching and doing stuff. And then I went to, from another sport to another sport. Yeah, you coach multiple sports, I see. Volleyball, yeah. basketball. Yeah, oh, what, yeah. what, what, that, was this something that you wanted to do or you saw a need in that area that you feel like, you know what, I can help these kids in a different way? Um, I think... I, I, I always love working with kids. I think as a young age, I always wanted to be a teacher and coach when I was young. I mean, I coached in high school. Um, I've coached softball and basketball in high school. And then when I, I when I was at, when, even in college, I used to like volunteer and, in, you know, junior Olympics and different things. I had my own AAU team. I think that I just wanted to help kids. And I love working with kids from the street because, you know, I grew up with not too much, you know what I mean? And I, I, I had, I, it was hard for me, I think, to work with kids who, who other than that, city kids. So I loved it because I felt like I could contribute so much to them and that I can teach them life skills that if, you know, if their uh, careers are ended or it doesn't take them where they want to go, there's other things they want to do. Right. Because, you know, obviously what happened to me, I mean, I was lost. I mean, I think anybody, who, if you love ball, you get this. You know what I mean? You put a ball Definitely. in your hand, Definitely. you know. Definitely. I am so happy when there's a, you know, a ball in my hand or two, two places, a ball in my hand or when I used to pitch because I was a pitcher too. Those are the things I love the most. But when I have a ball in my hand, even now, like before COVID hit, I was playing on, you know, two, almost three men's leagues. I was playing on Sunday morning pickup. I was, well, I was playing three times a week and on two men's leagues. I started playing out in Philly, which I was so happy about that because it was the third. I mean, I was playing out here with all, you know, with a whole bunch of white guys, predominantly like Jewish white guys. And not to say they're wrong with it, but, it was, but I, I was so used to always playing with, you know, with all my black friends that. You was busting the ass and it was just too easy. Just tell it, Lauren. <laughs> tell it. I needed to better run. Let me say this it was a little bit more of a quieter game. 
but you know, some of the, the guys would try to hurt me too. Some of the guys, you know, would, um, they'd try to show me who they were. When I started playing in Philly, I, I feel like I got a little bit more respect from the guys in the city. I think they could tell that I balled and I could talk smack with the best of them. And it was, that's you know, right, that's right. So, um, and I get into it. I mean, sometimes I forget I'm a woman and guys get stupid and, you know, I almost want to go toe to toe. You know, <laughs> and uh, actually, it's a funny story. The first time, I never had like guys have to stand up to me when I balled before. And my, my boyfriend was playing the league with me just recently, right before COVID hit. And some guy set some really nasty screen on me, but it was on, it was in a backcourt, you know, um, where there was nobody playing at the time. He was just right. trying to take me out. I probably, I probably had 14 points already, you know, on them. Cause I was averaging between 14 and 16 in that, in that, uh, that league. So he came up and clocked me and my, I mean, it just rattled me and I lost it. And I went after <laughs> That's right, because he, he hitting you on your yeah. back. Like, that's was, that's that area. Yeah, I was like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? I went after him, and my, my boyfriend comes up. You know, he, he's a big dude. He played football. And he's like, yo, that's my girlfriend. And, and I was like, I got so mad at him because I was like, it was so funny. I was like embarrassed because he was standing up for me. And all the guys on my team are like, Law, your man is showing you respect. He's watching out for you. And that's I'm like, I never had that before. <laughs> You know, I've had salute, guys salute to him. <laughs> I had guys real. take me out at Hoffman Park. You know, I mean, take me out, undercut me, because I used to clap the boards, you know. Ah! And uh, I had um, so, so all right, all right, all right, all right. Just because I was 5'11 and I got a little <laughs> that, just because I have Italian in me doesn't mean I can't jump. Clap, but to hear somebody say I was clapping boards, that's like, you know, yeah. that's classic right there. And I get up, I clap the boards, and some guy just took me out because I kept taking them. And my cousin was with me, lifted me up, and, and so when some big man picks me up, he's like, baby, you got a gash in your chin, he said to me. So I was like, my cousin takes his shirt off, and he's, he doesn't be like, well, you got a hole in your chin. <laughs> you can see my smile, I still got like lines because I got this huge gash on my chin. Wow. You know, so. Yeah. I came That's back and walk afterwards because, you know, now I wanted to knock this guy out and take me out. And um, all the guys, all my boys were like, don't worry, he won't come back to the park anymore, Law. <laughs> hey, they know. They know. So, uh, One time too many, that's to blaze some hands in me. Yeah. So I played in the Hoffman Park growing up. That's where I played in Queens. Uh, it's by uh, Queen Center Mall. Okay, okay, okay. In Left Frack City, Lost Battalion Hall. And now, yeah. you know, I used to watch Kenny get trained over there. You know, I mean, that's what I loved. That's how I got my handles, just from watching Kenny, actually. You know, mm. um, Kenny would have trainers, he'd have a ball in each hand. I don't think I could afford to have only one ball. I don't even know if I had a basketball, you know. And um, so, hold on, yeah. hold on. Before you start, Lauren, that's so important, right? Because yeah. I was just talking to my guy you about hands. this. You got to work on No, the fact that a lot of us ballers didn't own a in basketball. Oh, I know, <laughs> yeah. The court. And let me tell you now, there's like six of them in my garage because we will always have a ball in my house. And maybe that's dead, right. But we're gonna have a ball. But yeah, I mean, you couldn't. And then my parents didn't really want me taking one to Hoffman Park because when my brother was growing up, he got robbed at knife point for his basketball. Wow. So yeah, so they didn't want me taking a ball because, especially being a female, especially right. in Lost Battalion Hall, because I go. Like I said, I played Lost Italian. I'd watch Kenny, and they were training him. He was, you know, whatever. And I was like, I'd absorb it. To this day, when I train my basketball players, I do so many of those drills just because wow. I watched it. Because I, my dad, and I told you, my dad used to throw me into the garage and then say, you know, Larry Bird can shoot with his left hand. You need to be able to shoot with your left hand. So, and, and, and now when I dribble, I actually look like I'm a left dominant player because I always go to the left side first. It's just a natural instinct. And my right hand isn't as strong ball handling wise, even though I shoot with my right. Laura, you know what we call that? When your right hand, when you shoot with your right hand and you dribble to make your move with your left hand, that left hand is called the boogie hand. And we got that from Pearl. We got that from Pearl. Oh, yeah, is that what he said? Yeah. <laughs> Pearl used to have the ball way out here, but he was right-handed, but kept the ball mostly in his left hand. 
I got a picture with Peron Bernard King back in the day when they were Christy King. Yo, can, can, you send me, can, you, can you send me that, Laura, please? Uh, yeah, I got to find it. I will. I got to find it. Yeah, appreciate it. Like, uh, I got this, like, trunk full of stuff. But, yeah, because, you know, things weren't digital back in the day. <laughs> right. You know, just take a picture, boom. Any yeah. old articles, please. Yeah. That'll be good. Oh, I, I have all uh, that I got because I was thinking about putting them in my book. But when the, my publisher shot me down about putting them in my book, um, I was like, oh, all right. Well, I guess I won't do that. Because I felt like if I was going to tell my story, at least I'd better prove that I did something. You know what, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Right. But, but it's right. okay because the book is really just trying to help athletes who get injured so they don't fall, I mean, fall into a depression or anything like I did. I mean, I was messed up for a long time. It was very, it was hard. It was, it was hard when I lost my basketball. So um, I'm, that, that's why now it means so much more. And, and even though I'm still competitive, like I said, when I it was a baseline jumper, that's what I took. Of course, I couldn't think of the word baseline. I don't know why my phone keeps just. Hold on a second, it's driving me. Uh -huh. Amazing story, amazing story. Good. Yeah, y'all, yeah, we still here. We good? Yeah, still good. All right, yeah, I lost you on my. Yeah, so so um, finish up what you were saying. You remember what you were saying before that? Or you was wrapping that up? Because I want to get to the next question, yeah, right? Go ahead. Go ahead. Because uh, I'm sorry. when I'm having a lot of these interviews, I'm, I'm hearing from guys and even myself, uh, we chose the wrong basketball school, right? Oh. We talk about choosing those schools. Do you have those discussions with your players or clients that you see about uh, their situation at them and, and are they happy in the situation that they're in? When I, when I was training a lot of high school athletes, we'd have that talk, you know? And I always used to say something one of my coaches said to me a long time. And it's crazy because it happened. If um, <clears throat> he goes, if you were ever injured, there's two questions he asked. If you were ever injured, would you want to stay at that school? And you know what? I made a good choice. Do you want to be a Somebody just called you, right? Somebody just called you. Hold on, hold on. Somebody just called you, right? What? So you got to, let me, let me see if, hello? Am I losing? No, no, we good. No, no. I heard your voice that went out because I know somebody just called you. I'm good. I'm like, I'm I, 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 so, um, so those are the questions I ask, and I always try to tell them that um, just make sure it's somewhere you, you want to be. I think it's really important because, you know, nobody ever wants to think about their career ending, and I know that it sounds like a downer just to even bring it up. Nobody wants to talk about that, but the bottom line is you need to because yeah. why are you going to school, right? You're, you're getting an opportunity that other players aren't going to get if you get to play, even if it's D3, D2, maybe your books are paid for, you're getting something. Make something out of it. And if, if you're going to get injured, do you still want to enjoy being in that state, being around the, you know, those players, being around the people, anything? you got to make sure you, you, you like it. Because at the end of the day, you know, when you're done, you still got you. And you got to figure out, am I comfortable with me where I'm going to be? So. And, and, and I decided to stay. Those are, the op those are the options I weighed before I made a strategic move to leave. But my mom wasn't having it anyway because she said, I sent you to get an education. Uh, I did hurt my knee uh the end of my sophomore year, like in the middle of my sophomore year. And this the whole system wasn't for me, but the school and what it done for me, education-wise and socially, uh, was a good thing. So that was the plus that kind of overweighed the basketball situation. So and and I had my and I had that sit down with my with my coach like you had with yours. Oh, yeah. So I, I think kids or athletes if they have something that's on their heart you know you can always do it in a respectful way next time you see the person to let them know your feelings while you were at that school and what you was going through oh i think i think it's important i think it's very cathartic i think that you know when you are an athlete and you're and you're in it with your coaches i think i don't think kids today but i think when we were you know being brought up 
there was so much respect like for your elders so you don't question yeah. them you don't ask them you yeah. don't say what you're feeling plus you know we're li we were a little tough back then you, you don't want to say you don't really say what you're feeling right now everybody just says whatever my kids say anything and you know and i'm teaching them to speak up for themselves right. back then i didn't know how to tell my coach no i still i want to play pac 10s i don't care what the doctor says can we fight it you know and i think back then um i didn't have the confidence to and i think it's a, and, and and it wasn't because i didn't have the confidence i think my confidence was stripped when i went through that situation at the high school because you know when someone's telling you almost every day you're nothing you, you know you're, you're not going to do this you're not going to do that and you you get this fear in, inside of you maybe that's why i became so tenacious and i was a pressure cooker you know sometimes people can go the other way they cower and step away from it maybe i, I the only way i can look at it is when you ask me that question now in hindsight maybe i internalized what that person did to me and I was able to say, I want that ball. You know what I mean? No matter what, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show this. Ball. I always had that attitude when people try to this day when people try to push me down. I'm gonna show them that I can do it. Don't tell me that I can't. You know. Wow. So going through all the things that you went through, that made you go down the direction to get into like sports, fitness, and recreation. Correct. I, um, my first thing was I was going to be a physical therapist, so I studied exercise science. And then I was in physical therapy too long from being injured, so I kind of shied away from that. And right. I became a, a phys ed teacher. And then I went for my, my master's um, in administration uh, for education and, and all that stuff in education. And then um, I also wanted to do something with athletes to help them in sports psychology. I want to help athletes with, I, I work with athletes like if they're injured or if they have anxiety before a game, I help them with, you know, mental imagery, all that kind of stuff. So I was able, the great thing about becoming a phys ed teacher and then a coach, I was able to put everything together. So it's real cool. Now, listen, I, you're definitely qualified to do this, overqualified to even go through the experiences that you went through kind of, will help you with the clients that you see, right? Because you learned from first-hand experience and some of the things that you went through, you can identify with that. So definitely, that's that's a good path that you're going down right now. Yeah, well, that's one of my, I mean, that's, that's one of my businesses that I have. I mean, my main business is something a little different, but yeah, I mean. <laughs> hustler, like, hustler, since my main business is something else, but you know. Well, yeah, I mean, I have my business, Mind of a Body Athletics, and that's where yes. you know, when I was training a lot of athletes and I was working with a lot of athletes, and I still do, but more, it's on a more, you know, they have to be serious now. You know, when I was younger, I really, I, I, not that I don't enjoy it, but I have children now, so when I, if I'm going to take the time to work with someone's child, it's because they really they really need it, and they're, they, they're going somewhere. And it's not because the parents are pushing them to right. play the parents feel they need it. It's because this child really wants to help. I have people who call me from all over the country and I'll FaceTime with their child for sports psychology services. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and, and just give them some mental tools. I just give them some tools for their little mental toolbox. And it's not like a, a regular psychologist where people would see each other each week. Right. I work with them for a few weeks and then they let me know if they have a competition. We talk about it. I, I see a video and have the parents send me something. I could see when they had a break, like a mental breakdown sometimes or where they broke down and help them. And even when I train athletes, it was the same thing. I used to run a ton of basketball clinics back, you know, back when I lived in Connecticut. And I miss that, but I don't have the connections out here in Philly like I had in, when I was in Connecticut or New York or even Arizona to have a gym and that kind of stuff. But, um, no, I, I, I definitely still do it. But, no, my, my meat and potatoes is predominantly my, my uh, sport, fitness, and recreation, my experting work, where um, – I'm an expert witness, so if, like, like you see CSI when you go to court yes. and I testify yes. in trial. So if somebody is injured or killed in a sporting event or fitness facility, wow. um, attorneys will retain me to, you know, write a report or go do a site inspection, like at a trampoline park or in a gym or a fitness facility. And so that's that's what I do now, besides being a professor for like a few universities and stuff. I, Listen, I are y'all hearing that? Are y'all hearing that, people? She's putting that education to work. I'm a little bit over here on my, believe me, my student loans will, will tell you that too, they're like a mortgage. But I, um, you know, 
I'm like a little bit of a workaholic. I, I think from losing my basketball career, I feel like I've always had to fill a void. You know? Now I'm going a little cuckoo because I can't play ball with this COVID. You can't play ball. Right, I'm right. Game, like all this way, my family's all. I have a fatness video. <laughs> no, you don't. Not at all. Not at all. You so, good. You good. You know, I, I hit the COVID almost 20 at this point. I'm like, man, I better get out and start playing. <laughs> I hurt something or somebody when I play. I fall on somebody. Wow. Else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I forgot to ask you a question, right? Uh, the, the James Major question, right? James Major, who started Bishop Lockwood with the Seton Hall. He said, <laughs> when he was with, when he was at Seton Hall, they got five dollars for mill money, and they was playing in the Big East. Five dollars? Thank you, somebody, somebody. <laughs> yes, five dollars, Laura. Let me think. Hold on, I got to think. In the early nineties, that might be accurate. No, it can't be accurate, Laura. I'm telling you, I was at Fairly Dickinson. There's no way that Fairly Dickinson basketball. Did you get a Luchak? Excuse me? Did you get a Luchak? We got a Luchak. So. No, we're not talking about that. We talking about when you go on a trip with your basketball team. Yeah. And they give you mill money. It's called mill money. No, no, no. You're right. You know what? I think. Well, I think it's accurate. I don't remember getting more than five dollars for meal money. What? And, you, know, you gotta remember we're both females. It ain't like it's not like it is now. Yeah, okay, okay, true, true, true. But I'm hearing a lot of guys saying five dollars, fifteen dollars. Listen, Laura, we go on a road trip. We take a road trip somewhere and we get on the plane, it's at least three fifty in the envelope. And this is all legal, like cause this is part of the budget. My coach explained the whole thing to us about college basketball. Okay, let me give you an example. If Arizona State wants to play Fairly Dickinson, which is a smaller Division One school, right? Arizona will write out a check to Fairly Dickinson Ooh. and pay them for travel expenses. Yes, oh my God. the school, the school gets some money. Now, check this out, Laura. If Arizona State loses, they're upset. That's where the word "upset" come from. There's no upset in pro sports. Wow, that's interesting. My coach taught me that. I it had to be 1989, 80, like 1989-90. Because we were playing Wake Forest. And he was so giddy. And I'm like, Coach, you're in a good mood. He was like, yes, Harley, because we just got an $80,000 check from Wake Forest. What? I said, what do you mean? He said... And I wish when I interviewed Bobby Hurley, I asked him that question. <laughs> Listen, this is this is this this is about to get deep, right? Because my coach told us, told me at that time I was in his office and broke down like the business of college basketball. He said, "Remember, Harding told us this is a business as well. This is part of the business, that's true. right?" And we don't realize that, so that's happening right in front of our face. So before my coach got to my school, he was at Syracuse with Jim Beheim, and they went to the Final Four with uh, oh, Roy Danforth. That's a whole different story. Listen, and I'm going to move on. After Roy Danforth left uh, Syracuse, he went down to Tulane. At Tulane, they coached a, a player by the name of John Hot Rod Williams. John Hot Rod Williams was given... $30,000 in the shoebox, and it destroyed Tulane's basketball uh, team. They didn't have basketball for like another 10 years after that. My coach, my coach and Roy Danforth left Tulane, came up east to Fairly Dickinson, and nobody ever said anything. <laughs> and John Harbaugh Williams, you know, he... You know, he got to play in the pros. He became an all-star, but the school was damaged for a long time. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know how Syracuse has gotten away with some of the stuff they, they did. I mean, that, that ball no, ball trust ball ball me. So Yo, listen, I know. I know. Rob Johnson was one of their aces. And every 
everyone, everyone says, everyone says PJ. Giving out envelopes. See, see, Laura, you know, Laura, you are a legend. Hey, Rob, we got to go meet Rob. We got to go meet him. We take you to dinner. And me and we go meet Rob. And then me and Rad will go out. He's like, you want to buy some? He was got me all this Syracuse jackets and stuff. Real talk. Real talk. And I remember being in, uh, when Rad signed with Syracuse. We was up at Empire State at the time. I was playing on the open team. Were you playing with E. Brown? Yes, I was on that I team. Was up there. Yes. I was on the team with Derek Chivas, Eric Brown, Boo Harvey, Ross Strickland. I was the youngest guy on the team. I was going to be a uh, freshman at Phil Dickinson after that summer was over. Wait, was that 88? 88, 89, yeah, yeah. That was I was going to ask you that well, one of my questions was, did you play Empire State? I did, and I was up there, I was hanging out with, well, let's see, who was playing younger than you? Carl Beckett, C. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, Kenny was on that team, yeah. yeah. Kenny, or, well, I was hang, well, Kenny introduced me to Rad, and then I was hanging out, it, well, and I was friends with Carl, because Carl and I went to Christ King together. Yeah. To me, and then I'm trying to think who else. And then, um, yeah, Eric and I were really tight. I'm cool, I'm so cool, Eric, that's my boy. Yeah. Oh, you know who I reached out to? Oh, oh are you still in contact with Eric Brown? Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he's a cop out in Miami. I heard about that. I, I, I need to speak to my guy. If you speak to him, Facebook. huh? Hook up with him on Facebook. He's on Facebook. Got you. Yeah. I'm, I'm... Yeah, because I was gonna. I thought I. I asked a few guys to interview them for my book, and he he didn't really respond to it, so I left him alone because I don't press with anybody. You know, right. I ran into. So I was coaching Shamika Holsclaw in AAU's. I was I was uh, assistant coach for AAU's, and Shamika was playing, and uh, we were out in Miami, and we went to. Um, one of the dads was like, come on, with his daughter, he was taking us to see an exhibition game for the Heat. So we're sitting like up in front, and he is taking a lay of the Z Brown. And I'm like, no, he's not. So you know, like a lunatic I am, I go screaming, running, I'm on a camp. He was on he played for the Heat when the Heat first started? <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't know if he played a full season or what, but he was in the exhibition game. Wow. I'm like, Please, please, and and when you find your articles, send them, and I'll do a day just of Laura Milley. Oh, You'll have your own that's day. Cool. That's scary. We'll, we'll do that. That's, that's funny. You nah, know, nah. I, I don't. I, I think it's not a big deal to me. I think because in my eyes, because I got injured, I didn't make it where I wanted to. You know what I mean? But I guess when I look back, growing up in New York and being something in the city where you become one of the, you know, number one players and stuff. It's really not something to frown upon either, I guess, you know. So, it's, yeah, 10 million people here, Laura. 10 million, almost 12 million, easy. Yeah. That's probably not counting. And not many get to experience what we get to experience. That's the truth. I mean, you know, basketball is a vehicle to so many different things. Yeah. I mean, look at the six degrees of separation just from me talking to you through Pat. Yeah. I mean, yep. I don't know how Pat and the boys back in the day, and they all came out to Arizona, and we were watching Stefan play ball. So they hooked me up, and we got, you know, the eight row, and I'd be hanging out with all the guys. And they were like, more, bring your girls. And, you know, and we'd all hang. It was really cool, you know. So, I mean, just all of that stuff that sports has brought, especially basketball, has brought to all of our lives. And just yep. how we met and how, you know, I mean, it's just so cool. So I guess, yes, yeah, so that's nothing, something you can't, you know, bat an eye at, I guess. You know. Listen, I I interviewed Ross Strickland the other day, and to hear him say, playing in New York made him who he was, mm -hmm. right? So by the time he got outside the country playing because guys, it, it wasn't that hard because of what he was going through in New York City. That's now, he could have easily said, man, I played against everybody around the country. No, he was like, yo, bro, ain't giving that up to God. The Silk, the Spice, the John Johnsons, the James Majors, all those guys, he just like, yo, 
Joe Jackson, like just giving it up, saying these guys are the guys who kind of shape who I became. Well, you know what? You you grow up playing ball in New York. You can play anywhere, and, and I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I I wouldn't be able to go just walk on a court now like I do and, and have the guts to do that, or go on and just do play. Um, I mean, like I do out here. Like I joined that Philly league at first. Some of the guys were like, "Oh, Warriors aren't gonna be able to hang on that league." Some of the guys from my that other league I was in were talking smack. "Oh, Warriors aren't gonna be able to hang on the league." I did better in that league than I did in their league. Well, wow. Guys trying to beat me up in this league. I got. <laughs> and the guy, and now the guys are letting you live, and they so much better. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, you know, it was cool. Now they were recruiting me right before. They're like, "Whoa, you're gonna play with me this time? You're gonna play with me?" So it was kind of exciting because I was like, "Oh, now I can kind of pick and choose," you know. And they let me run the point too because I wasn't a point guard, but I'm now a point guard. I mean, I always play point, but I never played in college. That would be my thing. I was a shooting guard. Got it. Shoot free swing. But now I just I rather hook everybody up with the ball and shoot when I need to, you know, that kind of thing. But the thing is, these guys just kept hooking me up with the ball and setting screens. So that was fun. Listen, you 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 just scored enough points and hit enough buzzer beaters that you you know you ready to give it up now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> not wrong with that. You know what it is? You get to a point in your life where you have nothing to prove. Yes. And um, I think after I got injured, I felt like I had something to prove, so I kept playing, and I proved to myself I could still do it. I proved that you know, like I told you, I played tackle football. I was a tight end for two years for semi-pro. Then I was a Golden Gloves boxer in New York when I was 32 years old. I, at Lost Battalion Hall, I went back to play ball in the boxing out, out of Lost Battalion Hall. You know, I was 32 years old fighting against 18, 19 year old and boys too, because I had no one to spar with. These guys would beat the cuck out of me, man. But, you know, um, I think, like you said, just growing up playing ball, doing all the things that we did just made you strong. It takes a lot to walk on a court and play ball in the city with a whole bunch of guys you don't know as a guy. So as a female to walk on, and I'm like, who's got next? You know what I mean? It, it, they're like, uh, not you. I'm like, oh, no, it's me. You know what I mean? <laughs> don't tell me I don't have next. So I, you have to, like, fight for that. And as a female playing men's basketball, I always have to prove myself. Even now, like, if I start playing again, I got to prove. But even though I feel like I have nothing to prove, when I get on the court, I have to show my stuff. And then, I'll, then I, I'm then i cool with that. Like, I don't have to scroll those points. I go in. No, 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 no. You, you, listen, I can ball. Trust me, I, I did at the highest level. Let me show you guys. Then you yeah. kind of fall back. Yeah, because then some of these guys try to coach and coach me. I'm like, did you even play middle school? Like, really? Like, you didn't play middle school high. And you're telling me how I should be playing? Right. Like, passing the ball and playing, you must be crazy. Right, and let be like, your homie, you only played in the gym with like 20 people. You know how many people <laughs> I played in front of? I'm like, chill out. That's her. Like, calm it down just a little bit. That, you know, I like seeing you guys just walk into the park and go play ball somewhere. You let me know if you ever done that, you know? I don't think right. these, I mean, some of these guys can't just walk into the cage and play. You no, know, I mean, no, not anybody can walk into the cage and play ball. Listen, it wasn't. It was the time when I played against Anthony Mason that let me know you still got it and you can play against a pro and do well. After that game, I kind of stopped playing basketball. What and year I was did you hurt your knee? When, when did you hurt your knee? Uh, nineteen eighty-eight. So you heard what your freshman year or before your freshman year? 80, you I, it was 88, 89 in between my freshman and so sophomore right now, year. Empire State, your freshman, your freshman, like, yeah, yeah. It's horrible, man. I should interview you. Like yeah, look, look, look. I, I share a lot of the same stories. I hear people say, like, you know, I, I went through that. But I'm at peace with myself for the basketball and the mental aspect and some of the disdain I have for my coach because we had. My a friend of mine's teammate gave a barbecue and he invited my coach. We're sitting down, have a lovely time. I really got to know my coach in the two hours that I was having, you know, dinner with him. And I told him, I said, it's, it's so crazy that I got to know you in two hours more than I got to know you in four years of being with you. Well, I think as a player, it's a whole different dynamic and, and you're not going to say the same stuff then. Cause it may, you know what I mean? 
Well, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't a guy that, that kind of hold my tongue. I never was disrespectful. I kind of was made captain my sophomore year because I made everybody leave practice because of what he was doing. And I, I didn't think his tactics was working. So that, I was always able to speak my mind. But back then, I I didn't want to come off as hate and fiery, right? Yeah, sure, sure. I was a little younger back then. So as I became older, I, I'm cool with myself now, right? I got so, more fiery as I got older. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it, 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 and, and discussing it with him, it, it went well. But what I'm going to do, Laura, we're going to come back because it's running out. I'm going to show you a new art piece. I think you're going to like this oh, one. Oh, nice. Let's see. Yes. Wow. He's so fast at that back there. He just rolls. Oh, he, he, he's, he's the best. Trust me. So, what so I'll, gonna come I'll, back. Send you, I'll send you all that stuff. And, oh, I, I want to know, uh, Stephen. Queens, we used to go out there and play with my guy Rebel and play all over Queens, Rebel. man. Running, running. Yes, Rev. Rev is my guy. Definitely. I'm going to let him know you said what's up. Yeah, you got to tell him. You got to tell him. Uh, definitely, definitely. He, he don't do social media. I've been trying to get Rebel on here. Every time I try to get him on here, he send me somebody else's number. All right, great. Get them on. <laughs> always low-key. Always. So smooth. Yes. Low-key. Yeah. Yes. He, I told him right now, you know, and it's not to knock Tom, Tom Kachowski did a great job, but for somebody who's been around, Rebel's been around a long time. Oh, yeah. And he can easily step into that position because there's, there's not going to be any more Tom Kachowski. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> well, you know, Tom Kachowski, I told you he grew up on my street. Really? No, you never told me that. Oh, yeah. Tom Kachowski lived right up my street, right next to the church that I grew up at. Yeah, I went to Ascension grade school. He lived three doors down. Oh, yeah, he... He used to help me and give me advice on colleges and stuff like that, too. Oh, yeah. I, funny story. I ran into him. My, my, my girls were babies. They must be like three and one or something like that. And he's like, oh, what are their names? I'm like, oh, Madison and Taylor. He goes, kind of yuppie names are that? <laughs> <laughs> yuppie names. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Uh, I love Tom. Oh, what a good man. Yeah. Who, what about no right? Boy? He shook your hand firm. Make eye contact. No, he'll kill you. He, oh, he knew your name. What school you went to. Yep. And what college. And if, if you played in New York City, he knew all about you. So that, that was always great to see. Well, he was always, you know, he always was with boys. But when it came to me, because he was my neighbor, he was always, like, looking out for me. He saw me that time I had all that the ASU gear. I had just got back from BCIs. And I was walking down toward Hoffman Park, probably going to play ball. And he's because he'd go down the park too. Because I, I had mentioned you, I played citywide. I was on the woman, um, I was the only girl in citywide in high school. Wow, that's so right, that's right. I agree, that was the only girl. So he'd go down, I think, and check out the players. And Kenny was playing a lot, you know. And um, he was, he was like, "You got all that Arizona State here, huh?" I go, "Yeah, and that's where I want to go." So. I don't think he was too fond of me going to Arizona State only because they weren't. Did he? Did he say? Did he say something like uh, you shouldn't go there? Did he? He didn't say it to me. He's like, you're looking at other schools, though, right? You know that kind of thing, like that. Because I don't think he he, he knew it wasn't huge, but he knew more about the guys' stuff. So got you, got you, got you. State was a mess. The women's team wasn't that strong, but it was Pac-10, and Pac-10 was strong. So yes. I felt like if I was really going to get noticed. Because um, I had a different style of ball compared to the Pac-10, like the different players, because a lot of the girls were predominantly from that side of the world, you know, that side right. of the world, that I would stand out, and that's what I was looking to do. Wow. So when is the first annual basketball jam? Love to meet all the interviews. <laughs> well, listen, Larell Hendricks, I'm going to put this out there, because Larell was the first person to bring this up to me when I started a long time ago, he said, yo, G, we should have a basketball heads picnic, right? And, you know, sometime in the future where we can, can see people availability and get as many people together as we can so we can meet, share stories, you know, and make it something that, you know, we give out awards and, and things of that nature. And I was like, wow. And then my sponsor at Game Over, 
who has a gym. He has a, 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 a like a place in the back with their courts and place where you can barbecue at. So everybody was just all in. So Ballhead, you on point with saying that. Like he called it a basketball head jam. <laughs> but now I gotta go crazy looking for you. I'm getting my attic tomorrow, going through my my whole chest trying to find. Please, me. please, please, and send me some stuff, Lord. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I definitely will. Oh my God, I got side. Hey, Mike, you could be on, you could be on that committee, Mike, because you you're definitely a basketball head, fam. Yeah. So Laura, I want to keep you. I know you've been, your brain been working all day. Um, did you get a chance to see a picture? No, I haven't. He's still. Yo, can I, can I show a little bit? All right. He's he, he not really feeling me on doing that, but it's all good. We're going to do it. Don't do that to him. No, 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 no. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Yeah, that's much better, man. That, that was the Everlast picture, right? The, the serious look with the Everlast. I like that. Ooh, that one's cool. Yeah, that one's nice. And that's the younger you. Oh, God. Oh. So you're going to have two pictures. You can hang them up, do what you want. Uh, when you get them, I just uh, ask that you make the video, you know, shout us out and give us some love. I appreciate it. Oh, no, definitely, definitely, you know. Definitely. I All right, so, and I, when, when, you, when the book is ready, I'll see you my information so you can, you know, we can promote that right. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me again. It was awesome. Last definitely. Time. We, we got to talk a little bit more about different things. I don't think we covered the other stuff we covered before we covered. No, I, I, try, I, try, I try to do a little different this time, all right? So you don't see like you're saying the same thing over and over. Yeah, yeah. No, it was good. It was funny. Like, you brought up Rebel. I'm like, oh, man, running Rebels. I, you know. So you better should tell Yeah, me I'm, I'm definitely going to let them know that I had you on the show. Yeah. Oh, were you in that picture? It's a picture with Khalil Reed, Derek Phelps, and three female players from Christ the King. Are you in that picture? Uh, in the in the newspaper or no? No, I was, there's a picture I posted. It just, I it just had uh Khalil, Khalil Reeves and Derek Phelps, but also there's three girls in that picture that's not shown. Him. I'm gonna send it to you because Rebel sent it to me. Yeah, yeah I don't know who the girls are. Yeah, well. It might be. I mean, they're a year younger than me, so if it was a picture with their same age, then no, but it might be, because I used to hang out with Lynn all the time, me and my girl Heather, when we played, when we played at Christ the King, but I post, because you're not on Facebook, you see, I post those old school pictures all the time. I got See, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't scroll out on Facebook, so I don't really see those things. Can you get message on, um, in, no, Instagram, can you get message on the, the basketball heads on Facebook or no? Can you get messages? <laughs> I don't have this message on there. I I I, I gotta get it open, but no. I, I know I gotta get it up on there. It's just so many apps on my phone, and when I'm doing this, right, even this live, when I put up a show or I post something, it takes up a lot of space in my phone. Yeah. Right. So it's just I and I have two phones. <laughs> you need to get your sponsor to get you a nice computer or like a Mac Pro with like all these uh, terabytes. Oh yeah, I have. I, I I got. I'm staring at my Mac right now. So <laughs> now what you now what you said. Uh, so that way I could do my Instagram off my computer. That's what you said. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Can't you get them? Um, that's what I'm saying. Can't you get the stuff off your computer or no? Like, so how can I send? So you want me to send it through Instagram to you? Is that what you want? And I, I'll get it quicker. Okay. All right. Well, if you have an email. I'll send my email. You can send your email to me, and then I can do that too, just in case you know. Cause yeah, I'll I'll definitely send my email, and I'll check it all the time. So that that works as well. Yeah, that will work. Cause then I'll look. I know I have quite a few stuff. I even have some of the guy stuff that I say. I have. Yes, I have please. Guys, uh, me and Rad were being. Um, well, then Carl Beck and you know, Jamal Faulkner, no, because you know I play ball with Jamal and that I cry. Right. Paid as well. So I have all of those paper clippings because they're my boys. I cut them too. Yeah. So. Because I'd be on one page, they'd be on the other, you know, after the other page. <laughs> oh, I got to save that. And I realized, looking back 
uh, on an article that I say uh, that there were other write-ups on there as well that I never looked at up until now. And I was like, wow, these guys are putting some numbers. This, I remember this guy. Flip the page, you might see, uh, see me on the page behind you. Yeah, fact, they're very true, very true. <laughs> yeah. So, Laura, let me let you go. Get out of here. Thanks so much. I remember, when, when our book drop, come back again, show people the cover, what it looks like, so we can get this book out there and get it promoted. Okay, because you know what? I, what I want to do is I was telling my friends on Facebook, too, that I want to try to have a day that if anybody's interested in buying it, because I don't want to make people buy my book, but if people are interested, I'm going to say, on this day, please buy it on this day. Because if everybody's on, on, if I have a big volume that day, then I can get that. I Send it to me. I'll post it on my page. Make sure my, my, my partner's posted on their page and we can help you promote it. Cool. I want to get that volume. Listen, I'm I'm saying it again. We shoot for number one. Amazon best sellers list. That's right. <laughs> All right, to the homie. Yeah. Right. Going to read an excerpt from Dr. Laura Milley's book, Psyche of the Injured Athlete. Check it out. For me, playing basketball was such a euphoric feeling. It fueled my inner fire. It took me to a happy place. No one could stop me or my desires to be the best. When it abruptly ended, I felt lost and alone. Who was I if I could not play ball? That's real. Make sure you support the good doctor, and our own New York City legend, Laura Milley. Peace.